Hello and welcome to the third and final part of our series on radiometric dating. In our last video, we explored exactly how radiometric dating is done. Scientists can determine the decay rates of elements in the present and then look at the contents of rock samples and use that to estimate exactly how long ago those rocks formed. But many rock samples give ages in the millions or even the hundreds of millions of years. So how can we as young earth creationists interpret and understand this data? Well, first, I think it's important that we note that radiometric dating is not completely bogus. We have examples of radiometric dates that match perfectly to historically recorded events. 2 Kings 20 verse 20 describes how King Hezekiah created a conduit to connect the Gihon Spring to the Pool of Siloam, bringing water into the city of Jerusalem. Now, archaeologists have actually uncovered the structure, and carbon-14 dating of the plaster and wood which was used to construct the conduit revealed that it was created around 700 BC, which matches the biblically-derived dates for Hezekiah's reign. Another important observation to make is that radiometric dating matches stratigraphy. So rocks that are lower down in the geologic column, meaning that they were placed there first, have older radiometric dates than rocks higher up in the geologic column that were placed later. So clearly there is an actual pattern here that we as young earth creationists need to explain and not just dismiss. In 1997, a team of highly qualified young earth creationist scientists set out to tackle this issue. They were named the RATE team, which stood for radioisotopes and the age of the earth. One of the first questions which the RATE team attempted to answer was whether or not extensive radioactive decay, hundreds of millions of years worth, had actually happened. And to do so, they looked at some of the oldest rocks, the granitic crust of the earth, which by young earth creationists is believed to have been created directly in the beginning by God. And they noted that these rocks contain radio halos. Granite contains uranium and thorium, both of which are radioactive elements. And as these elements decay, they shoot out alpha particles around themselves into the rock, creating a ring of damage and discoloration around the little speck of uranium or thorium. And those are what are called radio halos. The decay products of uranium and thorium also are radioactive, and so they also shoot out particles, creating further concentric rings. And all of this can be viewed on the microscopic scale. And what the rate team found is that there was evidence that uranium had decayed through each of these decay products, meaning that more than 10,000 years worth of radiometric decay had actually happened in these pieces of granite. So let's talk about the three main assumptions of radiometric dating. First, we assume that a rock is a closed system. That is, the samples that we are dating have not had isotopes leached out of them, but they've also not had groundwater and heat and other processes bring other isotopes into the rock and contaminate it. Now, we know that some rock samples have been contaminated and we can radiometrically date them and see that it doesn't really match or make sense. But this in itself is not adequate to explain away all of radiometric dating. The second assumption that we make is that the daughter isotopes within the rock are the result of radiometric decay and that they were not directly created in that rock by God. We just talked about radio halos, and those are excellent evidence that God did not simply sprinkle these isotopes within the rocks, but that they actually are the result of successive radiometric decay. We also have many examples of rocks that were made since creation through natural processes. And so in these rocks, we absolutely have no evidence that God would have been miraculously creating isotopes within them. The third assumption that we make in radiometric dating is that the decay rates of the various radioactive isotopes have always been the same. So since these elements were created, they have always been decaying at the same constant rate. Could that last assumption be the answer to our question? Could radiometric decay have happened more quickly in the past? And is there any experimental evidence to support that conclusion? The rate team believes that the answer to both of those questions is yes. So how could the speed of radiometric decay be increased? Well, Dr. Eugene Chafin, a physicist and member of the rate team, has noted that the speed of alpha decay, 
is related to two factors, the depth of the nuclear potential well and the radius of the nucleus. So what's the nuclear potential well? Well, that's basically a modeling of how close particles can be to the nucleus of an atom. When you change the depth of this well, you're basically increasing or decreasing the probability that particles can be within a certain distance of the nucleus. And so by changing that depth, you can change the radius of the nucleus of the atom. And that can actually either increase or decrease the speed of radioactive decay. Okay, so we've got some hypothetical ideas of exactly how the speed of radioactive decay could be accelerated, but is there any actual hard evidence to show that it ever was accelerated throughout Earth history? One of the primary pieces of evidence that the rate team used was helium retention in zircon crystals. So the team evaluated samples of grand diorite, a rock somewhat similar to granite in composition. It too makes up parts of the granitic crust of the Earth. And this rock is composed of several different minerals, including biotite, which makes up these interesting flat crystalline sheets. Sometimes encased in these sheets of biotite were tiny, tiny crystals of a mineral called zircon. And these zircon crystals could sometimes contain uranium. And when that uranium decayed, it would release alpha particles into the zircon crystal. Now, Let's think about those alpha particles. What are they? They're really two protons and two neutrons. And really, that is actually the nucleus of a helium atom. All it has to do is grab two electrons, and it's a helium atom. And so that is what it does. Those alpha particles that are emitted basically turn into new helium atoms. And helium, of course, is a gas. It, it tries to escape out of the mineral. But as expected, this is kind of hard to escape out of. It's a hard crystalline structure. It's not very porous. And so helium can take quite a long time to escape out of the zircon that it is created inside of. So if there were accelerated radioactive decay, we should expect that a whole bunch of helium was created really fast within the zircon crystals and that it hasn't yet had time to actually leach out of the crystal. Whereas if this helium was produced over millions and millions of years, we would expect that it would have leaked out of the rock as it was introduced and created. So the Ray team obtained these samples of grand diorite, and then they isolated out of them these microscopic zircon crystals. And then they processed the zircon crystals to determine how much helium they contained. And they found that these crystals still had more helium in them than should be expected given constant decay rates. If the radioactive elements within these zircon crystals had been decaying for hundreds of millions of years, more of that helium that they produced should have leaked out of the crystal. But instead, much of it was still trapped within the crystal, indicating that the helium was produced fast and then hasn't yet had time to leak out. So the Ray team believes that there were certain episodes of Earth history during which the nuclear decay rates were accelerated, such that hundreds of millions of years worth of decay happened in a very small amount of time. Now this is not to say that the accelerated decay model is without flaw, because two very critical issues come to mind. The first being the biological problem. The issue is that radiation is very dangerous to life. Not only can it just outright kill cells, it can also damage the DNA and cause cancer. And so if you have a period of Earth history in which you're suddenly accelerating the decay rates, you're going to be bombarding animals with radiation, basically killing all life. The second, and I think more significant problem for the accelerated decay model, is the heat problem. You see, radioactive decay produces heat. And when you have hundreds of millions of years worth all happening at once, you're producing a lot of heat all at once. In fact, enough to melt the crust of the Earth. So that is a gigantic problem, and we do not yet have a solution to that problem. Some of the rate scientists suggested that the expansion of the universe could play a role in basically removing heat, but there's no clear, non-miraculous explanation for the heat problem as of yet. So obviously, this is not the final word on the subject. We need new young Earth creationist physicists who can continue to explore the mechanisms of radioactive decay. 
I hope that you've enjoyed this series, learned a little bit about radiation, how radiometric dating is done, and how we as young earth creationists can understand it. So thank you all for watching. Please make sure to like and subscribe.